Hey, welcome back to Resisting Church Authority Abuse. This is part two. This is about Watchmen on the Wall. Protestant history includes a woodcut authorized by Martin Luther. Pope Leo X had issued his bull, Ex Serge Domini, Arise, O Lord, and that was his attack against Martin Luther. Luther wrote some replies to that. He also authorized a woodcut by Cranach. Cranach did this woodcut showing peasants bearing their bottoms to the Pope's face. The Pope was more used to people, you know, kissing the ring on his finger. When a religious entity exceeds its just authorities, that entity itself becomes subject to correction. The very idea of Protestant, it says itself, protest is appropriate. Protest against spiritual abuse, the abuse of authority, is, is appropriate. And, and resistance against that is, is fully appropriate. It's proper. And so it's built into our name, it's built into our Christian heritage to protest against the abuse of spiritual authority. But I want to tell you about uh, something that the prophet Isaiah says. Let's, let's go and look at it in the next room. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem. They shall never hold their peace day or night. You who make mention of the Lord, do not keep silent. And give him no rest till he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. God has set watchmen, plural, on the walls. Uh, this isn't limited to the pastor, to the conference president. It's not limited to the conference executive committee. That's not limited to delegates in a constituency session. The watchmen on the walls are every member, every believer who follows and upholds the present truth that God has shown his people. God has set watch persons on the walls of Jerusalem, not to us. That means on the, wall, on the walls of the church. The church is his fortress. The watchmen never hold their peace day or night. They're not silenced by threats, rightly or wrongly interpreted or applied. They persist. Keen-eyed soldiers high on the walls kept these ancient cities secure. They were scanning the horizon looking for a dust cloud maybe from movement of an army or a cloud from fires, campfires set up at the campsite of the armies. They were always watching and they kept the city secure by their vigilance. And who are the watchmen? Well, they would make mention, hey, there's, we see signals out here that there's a, an army approaching. Who are the watchmen today? Well, the watchmen today are all those who, and Isaiah tells us, all those who speak of the Lord. Look at Isaiah 62, 1 and 2. For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. So then you and I are to give no rest until God establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Humans are to be guardians for God and for each other. You know, we... We pray for each other, we intercede, we mediate. When somebody is going to have a surgery or somebody's been in a terrible accident, we pray. The church prays. We pray for our members. And God has people who are serving him, and we are his watchmen. When we pray for each other, when we pray for the church, when we watch out for the right things to be happening in the church, we are serving. Uh, we're watchmanning. We're serving as his watch person. So the watchmen today are the same as in Isaiah's time, those who make mention of the Lord. So then you and I are to give God no rest until he establishes Jerusalem and makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth, until he establishes his church and makes his church a praise in the earth. You and I are to do our part. We're to be faithfully on the walls, faithfully uh, defending, faithfully upholding God's things. We're to defend the truth. We're to defend the faithful. And you know, our position is non-negotiable. Did you hear God speaking through the prophet's voice? Look at Isaiah 62, 1 and first part of 2. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory. So verses 6 and 7 also tell us that we do not rest. And so if God is working for his people, the, the, the people themselves, the membership is working to be faithful. So God is doing it. We're doing it. We're all in this together to keep God's church right and pure in you know, tracking with, with his purposes. And so how long does that last until God completes his purposes for his people? The church membership and God are working together. So today, let's not just theorize. Let's look at, at, at present day, current, according to uh, the, the, the church here, present-day current distribution of authority and responsibility in, the, in your local church board. Let's just see, see what it says. And so uh, we're going to look at pages 134 and 135 here. 
for some of the duties that the World Church has assigned to your local church ward. Did you know this? So there's a long list of things here. This isn't everything on the list, but uh, did you know this? I'm looking at number one on the list. Every church board is charged to have an active discipleship plan. That's, that's not, you thought that was the pastor's responsibility. It belongs to the church board. An active discipleship plan. Number three, spiritual nurturing and mentoring of members. That's the church board's responsibility to see to it that that happens. Uh, number four, maintenance. There it is. Maintenance of doctrinal purity. Right there. Maintenance of doctrinal purity? I thought that was the pastor's job. That's the church board's, pri one of its primary responsibilities. Number five, upholding of Christian standards. A lot of people seem to think that the authority rests in the church pastor, but in the local church, the, the authority really rests in, in the membership, and in the membership through the church board and the church in business meeting. So the last authority is not the pastor or the conference president. The last authority locally in the local church is the church members themselves. But you know what? The church board is assigned by the world church. This is a duty of the church board. The church board needs to rein the pastor in if he's being loose there. Okay? So these are primary, and there's more, there's many more, but th these are primary responsibilities for your church board. That is interesting because, again, the church board gets its authority from the membership, and the church board members need to be doing this. This shows you why it's so important that church board members, as when the elect church holds its elections every year or every two years, electing church officers, this is a very important process, and it really has a lot to do with the tone of life in your church. You should only elect to the board members who are able to be steadfast, members who have some backbone. Uh, people need to be on the board who are, are not just capable or have means or, or are popular. They need to be people who are willing to uphold um, the, the evangelistic spirit in the church, to uphold the, the standards, the Bible-based standards, behavioral standards we expect in the church. They need to be people who are going to uh, be able, have an ability to, uh, to maintain doctrinal purity in the church. Pastors are important. Pastors have their place. They have some authorities. We'll talk about that in this series. But interesting to see what is uh, assigned, actually, literally, uh, actually assigned to the church board as, as key responsibilities. So no, don't depend on the conference. Don't depend on the pastor. You know, do your work as a local church board. Work with your pastor. He's supposed to cooperate with you. He's not supposed to rule over you. He's supposed to cooperate with you. Conference is supposed to be there to resource you, to give you what you need. Not, they're not there to rule over you and press you down with, with the thumb. Woe to the congregation that doesn't understand this. Now, let's look at something else here, again, on the current edition of the church manual. These are the SOAR authorities that are assigned, uh, responsibilities that are assigned to you. I'm on page 135 in the church manual. Two-thirds down the page, it says this. It is one of the primary functions of the board to ensure that members are nurtured and mentored in a personal, dynamic relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing wrong with that. Everything right about that. But that's a primary uh, the word primary is used here. That's a primary responsibility of the church board. So how do they do that? Well, one way the church board can do that is they can invite guest speakers, uh, speakers that will come in and encourage the people, train the people, show them what the Bible says, show them how, how to do outreach, how to win souls, how to pray, how to study, how to be a Christian, how to be a believer. If the church board does that. Do what you can locally. See who can be helpful in your local conference. But also, a local church can invite guests to come in from outside, uh, other believers, other believers in present truth, other faithful church members and uh, speakers, invite them to come and present. A church board is completely within its space. When it's doing that, it's actually doing, it's doing what the world church wants it to do. So that's a good thing, and that's, that's a church board that is inviting serious kinds of guest presenters. You know, that's the right stuff. Way to go. Keep on doing it. Now, there is somewhat more to say about how the conference and the pastor kind of relate to guest speakers, but well, we're going to save that. But further on in the series, not too much further, we're going to get into that. But uh, let's come back to something that I mentioned back in the very first presentation. It was kind of, it was kind of an introduction, but here today we're going to get into a little bit further. I'm going to go back to page 28 here in the current church manual, and I want to share something with you again that I shared the other time. Here's what it says. This is the way our church is organized. Very very important. The Seventh-day Adventist form of governance is representative, 
which recognizes that authority rests in the membership and is expressed through duly elected representatives at each level of organization, with executive responsibility delegated to representative bodies and officers for the governing of the church at each separate level. Now, some people think like, you know, this is pie in the sky or, you know, well, my church, it doesn't work that way. Well, you know, is this like a new idea? Is this just like window dressing? Like we just say it because we want it to be true, but it's not really true. Or is this a long-standing uh, way that the that the church has has operated? I I brought along here today some of my uh, some of my collection uh, church manual collection different editions, and uh, not only do I have the current edition here, but um, I've got some other ones here. This, uh, for example, so we talked about the current one just published in 2023. Uh, this this little church manual here is from 1971. Go back 50, what, 51, 52 years, and let's see what this one says. And in fact, on page 46, I'm going to read to you from page 46. So this is over 50 years ago. Is this a new idea? So there's a list here called Forms of Church Government, Episcopal, Papal, Independent, Representative. I want you to hear what they say about number four, Representative. Representative. The form of church government which recognizes that authority in the church rests in the church membership with executive responsibility delegated to representative bodies and officers for the governing of the church. This form of church government recognizes also the equality of the ordination of the entire ministry. The representative form of church government is that which prevails in the Seventh-day Adventist church. 1971. And we can go back further, further yet. Go back uh, another 21 years. This is the 1951 uh, church manual. And we can go back there and we find the same thing. And we can go back further, uh, but I labor beyond the point here. Uh, this is this is the way we're set up. This is the way uh, we do things. It's, it's built into it. It's in the DNA. Before any of the contemporary problems arose in the church that you or I might be unhappy about, this was the way. This was the way that we were to do things. Kind of important to keep in mind. So when we say it rests in the membership, we're saying that, you know, in practical terms, you know, the Father gave authority to Jesus. Jesus gave a lent from some of his authority to the church. And so for practical purposes, that's where for us it sort of begins. It begins at the church and it goes from there through. The church uh, lends different elements of its authority to different, different officers and different persons. So you as members have authority. You, you are the root. All right. So how is it that authority rests in the Seventh-day Adventist Church? How is that authority expressed? And again, we have it, the same quote on page 28. Rests in the membership and is expressed through duly elected representatives at each level of organization, with executive responsibility delegated to representative bodies and officers for the governing of the church at each separate level. So let me ask you, does your church have a church board? Yes, it does. How is it that, uh, that things work? How did that church board get there? Well, the local church, you held elections in your church, and the church voted, and those people, there was a list that came from the nominating committee. We'll talk about that in another program. We'll talk about the whole election process in one program. Uh, but they, the uh, list came. People had opportunities to object or make uh, suggest corrections or say, no, that shouldn't be. Then eventually the church voted, and those people became your church officers, some on the church board, some not on the church board. And that's how they came to be there. They are elected representative persons. They are representing who? Who again? They're representing the local church congregation, right? Okay, so the people on the board, they're not there independently. They're not just kind of uh, guys that are there. Those people are placed there by the church membership to represent the church membership in the facilitating of things that the board does for the local church. So what does delegated mean? Well, delegated means that, you know, there's a body, it has authority, and it assigns certain authorities to certain persons in certain officer positions. So one person's a personal ministries leader, one person's the leader of this, one person is the leader of that, some people serve as deacons, etc., right? So that's uh, how things are parceled out. It's all done because the authority rests in the membership and they assign that off. So the body assigning authorities has more authority than the body that is re is being assigned. Now, one of the ways that authority is manifest in the church is that the church board is authorized to uh, invite guest speakers. Now, it says on page 126, in consultation with the pastor. It doesn't say they have to agree or that he has to agree. Sometimes the church will invite people or take make a decision, and, you know, I've been a pastor for about 30, 30 years or so here, right? I don't always agree with the decisions my church boards make, 
But you know what? I am bound by them because the authority rests in the membership. And I have, I have my uh, part. We'll talk about the whole pastoral part. But the church board has the last word. And so that's the way it works. So a church board is perfectly within its responsibilities to invite a authorized guest speaker. So we'll say more about uh, the different guest speakers and some uh, so eventually uh, some new things in the manual that are that are have a problematic element. We'll come to that. Right now, though, we're just looking at that this is legitimate for the church to invite guest speakers. That's they're doing their job, right? They're doing their job. Good for them. More power to them. Let's let's each church make sure we bring in serious presenters. Let's raise the standard higher. So there's more to be said about the relationship between the the conference structure, the sisterhood of churches and the conference, and the local pastor and guest speakers. And Ben, we'll be we'll we'll say it all, but we're going to come to that. And let's think about another thing about the church board. The church board. Uh, there's two kinds of meetings. There's closed meetings and there's open meetings. The church board meetings should 99% of the time they should be open meetings. Your church board should have a, should have a schedule, uh, the meetings, the members should know when the meetings are. If the members want to come and attend, they should be invited or welcome to attend. Now, a, 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 a church member may not, uh, he certainly wouldn't be allowed to vote because he's not a member of the board if he's not a member, uh, but he could listen. A person like that could, could participate by listening. Uh, some church boards will even allow you to, you know, speak up during, uh, during a, a debate over something, uh, something we're trying to figure out. Uh, although most of the time is going to be allotted to the board members. We can understand why that would be. But a lot of times we'll be glad to hear from uh, regular members, a member who has something to share. We're, we're after all, what? We're all in this together. We're trying to do the work of the Lord Jesus together. And so uh, God will work through us all, but we, we are a team. We're not, we're not set up to be conflictive toward each other. We're not trying to get into a conflict with the pastor. The pastor's not trying to get into a conflict with us, I hope, not trying to get into a conflict with his church. We're not trying to get into a conflict with the conference, uh, and, and the members are not trying to have a big conflict with the board. Most of the time, this just doesn't happen. We're trying to do the right stuff, okay? So uh, open board meetings. Now, there are going to be occasions when something really sensitive or a particular person or a disciplinary item is, is, is starts to be addressed. There will be occasions when you need to have a, a close the meeting, go into executive session, uh, but those will be by far the, the exception. If, if your church is doing executive session, like every every single board meeting, something's wrong. I've been in churches where I walked in, became a pastor, and found out right away, you know, like, man, these guys do an executive session every board meeting. That's not the way it should be. So we got to straighten that out. So open board meetings, a wonderful plan. Uh, we'll talk we'll talk about business meetings and so on. We'll talk about that next time. But uh, the, just notice that uh, your board and your membership are working together to achieve the same goals. And that's the way it should be. We'll talk more about member involvement on the church board, not just board members, but the whole church. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that very soon. We'll be addressing some of these bits uh, one by one and keep right at this. Uh, should have this done fairly quickly. So what did we learn today? What's kind of the key take home thing? We already talked about the authority rests in the membership, but what we've also learned what? That every member is a watch person. Every member is a watchman. We're watchmen on the wall. God has called us to a mighty work. We cannot come down. We want to hold on tight to God's truth. Get it right. Get it done. The Lord Jesus wants to come soon, and we want to be ready, and we want our local church to be ready. We don't have time to do ridiculous business and uh, think that we're some, somehow in charge of things that we're not in charge of. Let's work together, and the Lord will bless his people. God bless you. See you next week for part three.